بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا الحمد لله رب العالمين that we made it here today uh, tonight جزاكم الله خير for coming this is the second class inshallah of the fiqh of purification last class we talked about the etiquette of student of knowledge believe it or not it's extremely important and I hope we learned few things of the etiquette and, and manners and stuff like that which made the earlier scholars of Islam the greatest scholars of any time. Um, I've also uploaded the document on Facebook as a PDF so you can download it later and you can follow up inshallah because we don't have projector for today. So we're gonna get started. Um, from now on we're gonna do a little bit more. Today is still gonna be a little bit easy because um, we're going to talk about the history of fiqh, but we're going to also talk about introduction to fiqh. What's fiqh exactly? What does it mean? All that stuff. And then next class, we're going to go to the good stuff. That's what I call good stuff. You know, that's when we discuss the real matters of fiqh, water and purification and tahara and najasa and all these matters, right? But it's important that we know what is fiqh exactly and how is that different than sharia and and, and a little bit of history of fiqh and madhabs and all that stuff. Good stuff today. So, anybody can tell me what does fiqh mean to you? You don't have to be correct. Just tell me, what do you think when you say fiqh, when you hear fiqh? Jurisprudence. Jurisprudence. I can never pronounce this word. Thank you. Okay, jurisprudence. Anything easier than this? Rules. Rules. Okay, rules, right? Okay. Uh, very, very close. Both are correct, alhamdulillah. Um, so, fiqh, as you know, we have tradition in this class when someone make a correct answer, they get chocolate. So, I'll be here, you get one, catch. Sister, sorry if I'm, I'm throwing things on you. <laughs> so, fiqh, fiqh in Arabic, tafaqqaha fi shay, meaning to understand. Literally means to understand. The word fiqh, meaning to understand. If you, if you know in Quran, uh, the the people of Shu'aib who was one of the prophets they told him oh Shu'aib uh, ya Shu'aib la nafqa la nafqaha kathiran mimma taqul oh Shu'aib we do not understand much of what you say so the word fiqh meaning understand really fiqh in the literal meaning is understand I, I uploaded the document to Facebook as a PDF you can download it later if you're really quick you can do it now and then follow up with me because we don't have projector and Sahih al-Bukhari has a hadith from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu who says man yurid Allah bihi khayran man yurid Allah bihi khayran yufaqqihhu fi din whoever Allah wants good for him make him understand the deen make him understand the deen when you understand fiqh and when you study fiqh is when you perform your deen correctly because you could be doing a lot of mistakes in the salah and in the zakah and the siyam and in the wudu and these are the core of the religion. If you look at the Quran, for Quran, what do you think the Quran has? Uh, you know, what does the Quran cover? That's a question. Almost everything, right? Huh? Everything? Oh, that's a general word, but let's be more specific. Quran has? Uh, hmm? No, real, raise your hand. Huh? Ahkam. Ahkam, rulings, okay, which is fiqh. Quran has fiqh, what else? Stories, qisas, right? And what else it has? Tawheed, excellent. Worship, she, she answered twice. She got to get a chocolate. <laughs> okay, sorry if I'm throwing things on you. Okay, Quran really is Tawheed or worship, stories, right? Stories of the prophets, stories of the people, so all this stuff, and, and rulings. So if you think about it, the fiqh is one third of the Quran. If you understand fiqh, Basically, you understand almost one third of our religion, inshallah. But then there is the word called Sharia. You ever heard about Sharia, right? Sharia. This is a little bit tough, so I'm gonna help you out. Sharia basically means a straight path, or a river, or a stream. The, the word Sharia, right? If you want, take your own notes because the PDF I sent has all this stuff. But take the things that like strike you. You don't have to take every single you know word because everything is here for like. Um, so the word Sharia meaning a path or or a way. However, technically it means the divine revelation and knowledge which is only obtained from the Quran and Sunnah. That's the word Sharia. So Sharia 
for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Quran said, ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَاكَ عَلَى شَرِيعَةٍ مِّنَ الْأَمْرِ فَاتَّبِعْهَا وَلَا تَتَّبِعْ هُوَا الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ It says to Prophet Muhammad, Oh Prophet Muhammad, we have made you on the, uh, we, have, uh, we, have, we have made for you a way of commandment, which is the way of commanded of all the messengers, so follow that way, which is the Sharia, and follow not the desires of those who do not know, right? So the Sharia is a way. Who is Al Musharri? Al Musharri is a person who put the Sharia, right? Who do you think is the entity that put the Sharia? Raise your hand if you know. Allah, of course. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, right? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is the one who, who is the Musharri. Musharri is the person who read the Sharia. Was Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Musharri as well? Yes. Yes, she says yes, no, yes. Was Prophet Muhammad also putting laws? She said yes. Yes, perfect. That's a good answer. Yes, but he was not an independent one. He was not doing it from his own, but he was still musharra. That's why we have Quran and we have Sunnah, right? And the Sunnah is the sayings of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The, the, the practice of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the approval of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? How about the Sahaba? Were they Musharri'een? Were they ones put Sharia? No, that is, that is correct. No, right? They did not initiate the law, right? But they, have the, they had the capacity and understanding of the law, like no one else. But they never initiated a law, right? Um, and then we, we have al-fuqaha. Al-fuqaha who are in our time, they are the scholars, they are the ulama who understand fiqh. Again, they did not write the sharia, but they the one shaped how the fiqh looked like, right? When we talk about fiqh later, these are the fuqaha and we will, we will understand this as we go on. Okay, so the sharia, if you think about it, is more general than fiqh. Sh sharia is the source of all Islamic laws including fiqh, right? Whereas fiqh is specific to rulings, right? Which is derived from the sharia, right? So in, in, in a way, the sharia is the body of all the laws. The fiqh is the body of the rulings derived from those laws. In other, in other another uh, comparison, sharia is fixed. It does not change. It's not, it does not change. It's not subject to change based on circumstances, but fiqh, can change based on circumstances, based on even culture sometimes. When the Muslims started expanding and they went to countries like uh, where governed by the Romans and the Persians, different culture. The fiqh has to understand what that means. When you, when you ask these people for zakah and they're Muslims but they're new Muslims, you know, or when you ask them for jizya, right, which is they're non-Muslim, they have to pay a certain amount, right, what does that mean to them? So the fiqh has to be flexible enough to accommodate these. Now, um, the laws of the sharia are considered general principles. But the, the ruling of the fiqh are considered specific and detailed. What do you do when there's such and such and such and such case? Fiqh, right? Fiqh. But the sharia is the, all the laws that exist in the Quran and Sunnah. Okay. If you don't get that, don't worry. This is just the introduction, don't worry. People, so you know, take six, seven years studying this stuff. And the stuff I'm telling you today is a, is a course that is usually taught over uh, 10 weeks. I'm gonna try to do it today. So be patient, and it's okay. It's gonna be a lot of information, but what I want you to get today is appreciation for fiqh and a little bit of understand what is fiqh and a little bit of history. Okay, now let's get a little bit more technical, right? Fiqh is the knowledge of practical legal rulings that are derived from specific evidence. Practical. Why practical? Because you says, what do I do when I'm traveling? It's a practical matter, right? Legal. Legal because if it's not related to the Sharia, to the, to the, to the Islamic law, it's not fiqh. It's not something else. What am I doing if I'm driving? Okay, it's practical, but it's nothing to do with Islam, so it's not legal. When we say le legal, meaning related to the Islamic law. And it's derived from specific evidence, right? What do I do when I travel? You can, you can wipe on your socks. Give me the evidence. Oh, he's like a liar, sorry. There you go. 
specific evidence. Why do you say I can wipe on my socks for three days when I, for three days when I'm traveling, and I can wipe on my socks for only one day when I'm at home? Based on what? There is a, there's an evidence, right? There is hadith. So that's what we call specific evidence. Okay. What's the big deal with evidence anyway? We Muslims are like so stuck at evidence, evidence. He was like, what is wrong with you guys? Are you scientists or chemists or, or mathematicians or something? No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us for evidence. We don't take our religion based on someone says, I think, I believe so, I guess. We don't do that. We have an evidence, right? Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, ati'u Allah wa ati'u rasul. Oh, you believe? Follow Allah and follow a Rasul. Wa ulil amri minkum, the your leaders, in tanazatum fishay, and when you dispute amongst yourselves about something, faruduhu, faruduhu ila Allah wa Rasul. When you dispute, what do you do? You go back to Allah and a Rasul, meaning the Quran and the Sunnah. That means what? Meaning evidence. We have a dispute, what to do in this situation? Right? We don't say, well, Brother Arm thinks so. Don't say that. Who, who, who knows about Brother Arm? Who cares? The brother Arm does not bring an evidence, then it's not, we don't accept, inshallah, right? Now, fiqh must be we, what we call comprehensive or jami'. Jami' is Arabic word for comprehensive, and it also must be exclusive, which is called mani'. Why? For example, let me give you an ex example of comprehensive. Um, if you say the apple is a fruit, right? Apple is a fruit. That's the comprehensive definition of apple. So, so comprehensive is where does this item belong? Where does it go? Apple goes to the category of fruit, right? But exclusive. Okay. But if I go to the supermarket, can I just buy any fruit and say it's apple? Based on the first definition, yes. Unless I have the man, which is exclusive. Now you'll say, no, it looks like this, and it's round, and it has seeds, and it's either green or red. Then you say, ah, oh, okay. So it's not this banana, and it's not this... Uh, watermelon, something like that, right? So the def so definitions in fiqh must be comprehensive, jama, meaning the categories, and must be exclusive, mana, which is the specific, right? Now, um, what are the sources of fiqh? The very first source of fiqh is Quran, right? Apparently, right? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, "Inna hada al-Quran yahdi lillati hi aqwam." This Quran guides to that is just that is just that is right that is best and another ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in surah al-nah he says وَنَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْقُرْآنَ تِبْيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ and we have revealed this book for you it has explanation or exposition for everything this Quran has exposition for everything but someone said wait a second so it has explanation about the internet yes it does it has explanation about cell phone? Yes, it does. Why? Because Quran says, it gives you the general rules. Right? We have made things halal for you. So someone said internet, generally it's, it's halal. How you use it? It could be halal or haram, right? And then Quran also said, follow Allah and follow, obey Allah and obey Rasul. And Rasul will explain to us certain things, which is the matter also of fiqh that we can say from it that, okay, cell phone does not hurt us, we can use it in, in a certain way, then it's okay, right? So not everything will be mentioned by name in the Quran or even in the Sunnah, but we have rules that we can drive things from it, and that is the source, uh, that is the science of fiqh. Okay. Also, remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أُتِيتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا Whatever you learn, and whatever you will learn, it will always be little, compared to Allah. That doesn't mean don't learn, it means learn, but respect a higher a higher being of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And also mean always continue to learn. So the first source of fiqh is the Quran. If you look at the Quran, when it discusses in the, in the, in the sense of law, first of all, uh, of fiqh, it has laws, but it's usually summarized. It's privity, privity of law, meaning general codes, right? Not detailed, right? Quran has detailed only few things like inheritance. Inheritance is very detailed in the Quran, right? But the Quran doesn't tell you how to pray. It does not tell you, you know, um, how much is your zakah, right? The hadith and the sunnah from Muhammad explain that. That's why they are, they are both, you know, equal source of, of uh, fiqh. 
So Quran gives you a privity of law, not detailed. Second thing is, generally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed difficulty. Difficulty from us. Allah will not burden a soul more than it can take. That's the general thing because sometimes people said, man, you have all these rules. You have all this law in Islam. It's so difficult. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا نفسا إلا وسعها. So even if you cannot do a certain things because of you want to pray, but you have you, you have a problem. You cannot stand, then you sit. You cannot sit, then you lay down. You, when, even when you lay down, you're, you're sick. Try with your eyes. That's, that's only for salah because salah is a must, right? So there are ease. There's always ease in how we apply the, the law, right? Um, Bismillah. Okay, we're getting started. Okay, guys, we're getting started. So, um, so we talked about all the differences, right? And we know that even though the sources of fiqh are pretty much known, there were, there were differences. And we talked about differences, right? Couldn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow no differences whatsoever? So everything is one way and that's it. He could have, right? If Allah wanted, he could have. Why did he allow it? When it's flexible, it, yeah. People find it easier. Flexibility, okay. Like you have more than one choice, right? Prophet Muhammad Aisha said, Prophet Muhammad Sallam, whenever he used to be faced with two matters, he would choose the easiest. Okay? We'll talk about this later because this could be abused too. But uh, so, flexibility, what else? Why did Allah allow differences? Changes in time. Changes? Changes in time. Some things might apply in the past, might not necessarily apply now, or something might be now recent that we don't never knew about it back then. Okay. Changes, uh, differences in opinion. Why not? Uh, why, why differences in opinion? What else? Differences in opinion and the matters of fiqh. Allah, if He wanted, He could have everything. Is, that's it. This is what you do in this case. This is what you do in this case. Why do we have, let me ask you in a different way, why do we have halal and haram? It's a test. It's a test. To see? What? To see who's uh, nice. Who? <laughs> who's what? Who's stay away from evil. Who's stay away from evil, which is, it's a test for who really, go ahead. You would. Test of taqwa, who really loves Allah. At the end of the day, this whole thing, halal and haram and makroor and mustahab and all that stuff, and the fiqh and the rulings and the different situations, who loves Allah? What does that mean? You do certain things. You grow up doing it. Someone show you with absolute dalil, this is not the right way. You love Allah, that's it. You stop. You stop, right? If you don't, what are you going to do? People say, yeah, but I'm not convinced. Yeah, really, is, is cigarette really haram because, you know, or is music really haram because it sounds good, man, and that, all that stuff, right? Is hijab really must, a must, you know? I just saw two, three days ago, Egyptian, he called himself sheikh, saying that hijab is not fard, it's not obligation. Because when it came in the ayat of the Quran, it says, Ya Nusa and Nabi, Qulli Nusa and Nabi, Yudinina alayhinna min jalabi bihin, say to the, to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu wives, to cover themselves, so that's only for them. I don't think he read the Quran because read the Quran says they are the example for the believers. The hijab is the example of the believers. He didn't read history because when the hijab came, Aisha was in the house with a bunch of sisters, or Muslims, Muslimas, and immediately when they heard the, the, the ayat about the hijab, they started bringing curtains from the, around them and covering themselves in the house. There's no men. Who loves Allah you love Allah someone tell you that's it that's it let's keep going now let's talk about history of fiqh a little bit there's a little bit of history okay so bear with me I'll try also to go through it the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam right that's like 13 before Hijra all the way to 11 after Hijra or something like that that's the time of prophethood okay itself uh, there's the Mecca time right and there was the Medina time. There's also why we call the Mecca or Mecca Surah and Madani Surah, right? In Mecca, 
the most important thing was Tawheed, right? People have to understand first, Allah is one. There's nothing like Him. He has no equivalent. He has no son, no, like that. Law of Tawheed and belief and believe also in the hereafter, right? They have judgment, Yawmul Akhirah. The laws of morality has to also come in the Mecca, like murder or zina or killing the daughters. The Arabs used to, when they have a daughter, what do they do? They are ashamed, they take the daughter, poor thing, and they put her, bury her alive. Islam came, Quran says in Mecca, says don't do that. Man yaf al dalik, you know, yeah, his, 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 if, his sin is huge. Also Quran came in the time of Mecca with basic rules of halal and haram, basic, not detail, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَكُلُوا مِمَّا ذُكِرَ اسْمُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ بِآيَاتِهِ مُؤْمِنِينَ Whatever is, is you say Bismillah on, the name of Allah on, you can eat. That's a general rule for make the food halal, right? But it's not specific. In Medina, there was more specific, specificity. See, it's very hard. <laughs> what he said, right? Mecca, rules of worship, uh, of worship, right? Do you know that the first salah that was actually ordained on Muslims was Qiyamul Layl, the night prayer, before any other prayer? Not many people know that. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal muzzammil, qum al-layla illa qalila. That who you cover yourself, you used to cover himself when you pray, stand up in the middle of the night. So that the Sahaba used to pray the night prayer for one year. And then it become optional. But because of that training, they never forgot the Qiyamul Layl. If you do anything for a year, you're going to stick to it, inshallah. Hopefully even less, right? Rules of Jihad. The rules of Jihad in Mecca was really no Jihad, no fighting, tolerance, patience, right? They were tortured, they were killed, they were this, don't do anything, not yet. So that was the rule of Jihad. Now comes to <coughs> Medina. In the Medina time, now came the law that came the laws of zakah, of hajj, right? Of fasting, siyam. And then came things like the commercial laws, like the trade laws, the business laws, stuff like that, doing business. Agricultural law, meaning zakah on harvest. Medina had, was always have, you know, uh, agricultural stuff, right? So you have to know what, what is a zakah on that, right? Criminal and justice laws came in the Medina. Building community, brotherhood, right? The, the, the rules of, of brotherhood, marriage, divorce, things of that sort, inheritance, all came in Medina. The rights of the people of the book, because now all of a sudden Medina is a, is a Muslim s city, but under it there was Jews, there was Christians, there was Mushrikeen, though they had rights. They have rights. We're Muslims, we cannot say, well, they're there, we're Muslims, go kill them. That's not right. That's not correct. We, they actually have rights upon us. That's why they also pay something called jizya. Just like Muslims pay zakah, if you live in a Muslim land and there's Islamic Khilafah, the non-Muslim pay the jizya, which is to protect them because they're not asked to be in the Muslim army. As a non-Muslim, you cannot be in the Muslim army. So we're going to protect you. So you pay, right? Uh, the law of the war, peace, and treaties all came. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent envoys, envoys to um, Rome, Persia, Egypt to call them to Islam, right? And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam established the first constitution ever which is in Medina. It's a very, very long constitution, very beautiful. We're not going to get into it. That can alone be hours and hours. The time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, fiqh was not defined. People would not say, oh yeah, let me do ijtihad, let me do qiyas, let me... They didn't know those terms, right? It was there. Everything came from Quran and Sunnah, basically. The source were Quran and Sunnah itself. But that doesn't mean there was no ijtihad. There was, but people did not define it that way. They did not call it that way. For example, <coughs> Prophet Muhammad sallallahu wa yantuq an al hawa il huwa illa wa hiyun yuha, right? Prophet Muhammad sallallahu does not say from his opinion, his revelation. But sometimes Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi made his own ishtihad. There was no wahi at that time. For example, in the Battle of Badr, right, before they, they fight the mushrikeen, they were looking for place of soldiers to camp. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said, I believe, let's camp here. A, a, a uh, sahabi by name is Habab ibn al-Mundir told him, Prophet Muhammad, is this from Allah or is this from you? Is your opinion or this is wahi from Allah? He says, that's my opinion. He says, okay, with all due respect, I think this is better. And he gave him a better place and Prophet Muhammad followed. That was ishtihad. 
Prophet Muhammad was, hey, I'm the Prophet, who are you? Right? That guy know about fighting and about the area and stuff. He says, Let's, uh, I'm going to do that, right? The other one is famous. After Battle of Badr. After the Battle of Badr, the Muslims were, anybody know how many were they? Three? Three hundred? There are 13, some people say 3, 15, 19, but 300 something, right? And the Muslims were many, right? Uh, I don't know how many, thousands or something like that. Um, after the Battle of Badr, uh, the Muslims captured many of the mushrikeen, right? Many of the non-believers, right? Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked, what should we do with them? Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, said, let them pay ransom, but they should teach the kids or the Muslims how to read and write. Like some work for that and ransom and we'll let them go. Umar al Khattab says, kill them. You know, Umar says, kill them. These are the head of the mushrikeen. They're going to go back and fight you. Prophet Muhammad sallam, he took Abu Bakr opinion, right? The ayat came on the second day. Meaning it's not for a prophet that he should have prisoners of war until he had made a great slaughter among his enemies in the land. You desire the good of this world, meaning the money of ransom, but Allah desires the hereafter. He knows best. So when that ayat came, Umar came the second day, this is Umar was narrating, he came and he says, I, I saw Prophet Muhammad and Abu Bakr crying. So he told them, what are you crying about so I can pretend I'm crying with you? You want to join them? So Prophet Muhammad told him the situation. Umar was right. Umar was right, right? Because Prophet Muhammad at that time did not have the wah. He also made ishtihad, right? But we also know that Prophet Muhammad is the most perfect human ever that walked the face of the earth, right? Um, Unfortunately, you cannot see this, but this is a map to show you that at the end of Prophet Muhammad you will see it in the PDF, inshallah, in the Facebook. The, the, the Arabian Peninsula was be, basically became all Muslims, right? After Prophet Muhammad we have the Khulafa al-Rashidin, right? Abu Bakr, and then Umar, and then Uthman, and then Ali, right? These are called Khulafa al-Rashidin. Some people call Al-Hasan ibn Ali one of the Khulafa al-Rashidin, which is the Hassan, uh, the, the son of Ali. Some people don't agree. The Khulafa al-Rashidin, uh, without going into a lot of details, the compilation of the Quran started. It actually started at the time of Abu Bakr, radiallahu anh, but it was finished at, at the time of Uthman, right? At the time of Uthman. I'm not going to get into details about that. The expansion of the state, Islamic state, started expanding even more beyond the Arabian Peninsula, right? And that, the, to, they went to new cultures now, right? All of a sudden, they're going to Egypt and they're going to Syria and different culture, right? So they had to have different thinking about the fiqh, even though they don't call it fiqh. Think, in this time, interracial marriage, right? It was not probably, back then, all Arabs, all of a sudden, something, right? Or think now, now today, eBay. Someone says eBay. Can I can I use eBay? Can I? And by the way, when it comes to fiqh, you cannot ask, is this halal or haram? You have to ask about the usage of it. So you cannot say, is pig halal or haram? No. Is eating the pig halal or haram? Is using the pig skin halal or haram? See the difference? You don't say, is this? Is the dog haram? Is the dog halal? I'm not asking you. I'm just, you know, just something to think about. No, we're going to get into that. There's a class about dog. We're going to be all like having fun here. Because it's important. Because it's very important. Is the dog haram? No, you don't say that. You say, if the dog lick you, right? Lick your clothes. Is it halal haram? If the dog touch you, skin to skin, is that makes it najis? You know, should I clean it now or not? So it's not that, that this, right? Okay. Um, also, the fitna showed up after Prophet Muhammad died. Many, والسلام, many of the so-called Muslim make radda. Radda, they became non-Muslims, right? Abu Bakr said, I'm going to fight them. I'm going to fight them because they used to pay the kharaj, they used to pay like jizya and stuff like that or whatever. He said, I'm going to fight them. And this one, there was the one big fitna at the time. And Abu Bakr, alhamdulillah, uh, won. After that, there was the killing of Umar, radiallahu anh, And there was the killing of Uthman. And there was the killing of Ali. Different fitna, different time, right? Huge history. This this can be just a class in itself, and I'm not trying to do that because it's very complicated. Um, but I'm just giving you highlights, right? In those times, also Al Khawarij showed up. 
right? Al-Khawarij have very strict interpretation of the Quran and Sunnah. And they call anybody that disagree with them kafir. Kafir. Right? You make wudu wrong, they can call you kafir. And not only kafir, and let's kill them. So Khawarij are, <laughs> you know, the <laughs> crazy people. Right? Khawarij, as, it, as, to, as if today, is more of a concept, not a group. There's no group we call Khawarij, even though some people can follow it and become Khawarij. Right? Some people can follow the concept or those principles or this thinking, and you said, but not me and you to say that for ulama. The ulama are the ones should say this is qualify as khawarij. And be careful with that. The more you study about fiqh and you more study about Islam, we cannot say, oh, he's munafiq, oh, he's kafir. It's a big win, it's a big thing. Prophet Muhammad said in hadith, if someone, if a Muslim call another Muslim kafir, one of them is kafir. Not the one who was called, meaning, the one who's calling could be wrong. So you cannot call someone kafir. But if you see something wrong from someone that does not follow Islam, he says, this behavior does not follow Islam. Does not follow Quran. That's fine. But you cannot call him something. Right. So the fitna showed up, the khawarij showed up, and the Shia showed up. Also the Shia time showed up. And by the way, they are the ones who let Ali down. They're the one like, oh my God, whatever. But they're the ones who let Ali down. Right? Big, big history. The sources of the of the fiqh at the time was the Quran, the same thing. The Quran and the in the in the time of uh, Khulafa. Quran, Sunnah, Ijma' only by the major Sahaba. Not any Sahabi. And if you study, you will see that there was major Sahabas and there was medium level Sahaba and there was minor level Sahaba, right? Major like Omar, Abu Bakr, Uthman, Ali, like Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah ibn Abbad, right? Right. And there is medium and there is lower level right uh, there was also ijtihad to a very small degree right Umar al Khattab did that and there's Qiyas who also Umar al Khattab did that um, an example of uh, example of uh, ijtihad Ali ibn Abi Talib long story uh, he went to Yemen right he was in Yemen and the people fr from the village they dug a hole and they wanted to catch a dangerous lion they dug a hole so the lion fell down in the hole so now everybody, like, wow, we have lion. Everybody went to the hall to watch. Everybody won. As they did, one guy tripped and fall in the hall. As he was falling, he tried to catch someone to hold, and he dragged him. And the second one hold another one, and he dragged him. And the third one drag, hold one, and four of them fall down. Right? Now, and all four died. The lion was happy, right? He had, had some food. There's a law... There's a law that says when, when someone is killed because of certain actions, there's a ransom. There's a ransom. So that ransom, let's say X amount of money without getting into details. There are four people die. Who gets the ransom? Do they get all ransom? So Ali thought about it. And he made it to her. He said the first one get 25% of the ransom because, because he caused the accidental death of three. So the ransom is 100%. He caused three death, three fourth. So he lost three fourth. He gets one fourth. SubhanAllah. The second one get 33% of the ransom because he caused the accidental death of two behind him. And the third one gets 50% because he caused the accident, the kill, killing of the accidental death of the last one. And the fourth one didn't cause anyone. He just died. He gets 100% ransom. His family, of course. Right? The ransom is for the family. Right? Now, Wow, right? You never, <laughs> but Ali, radiallahu anh, right? So he made ijtihad. Um, the time of the Khulafa, they did not give fatwa. SubhanAllah. And we hear giving fatwa like right and left. Anybody ask anything, question on Facebook? Everybody want to be mufti, all of a sudden. Everybody is sheikh. We even see people say, call themselves sheikh for some reason. Anyway, actually in Islam, you should not call yourself sheikh, but whatever. Um, they, the Sahaba tolerated each other's differences. When they had differences, you're right and I'm right. They tolerated that. Now we're like, oh my God, you pray like this, I pray like this, I don't want to talk to you. Right? Uh, Prophet, uh, uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu says, what sky will shade me and what earth will carry me if I say in the book of Allah something without knowledge? Abu Bakr. He most likely not going to do that. He's most likely not going to make mistakes. He's so worried to make even fatwa.
right? What's a Sahabi? Can anybody tell me what's a Sahabi? If you have the notes, don't look at it. Buddy. Someone who saw Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And? He saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in person. In okay. Anything else? He was around during his time. He was around during his time, okay. Hmm? Yes, he also had to be a Muslim and died Muslim. Because this is in Bayatul Aqaba, which was like early time, there was thousands of people who witnessed Prophet Muhammad. But many of them, some of them became non-Muslim. They do not, they're not called Sahaba, according to the, most defini the best definition. So Sahabi is someone who saw or heard. There was one Sahabi who was blind, so he could not see. But he still heard him. He's a Sahabi. Saw him, heard him, witnessed him, and he was Muslim, and he died Muslim, right? Um, even if he saw him or, or heard of him one time, right? In the time of the Khulafa al-Rashidin, the Islamic Khilafah went to Iran, what we call Iran now, Egypt, Libya, you know, uh, Bilad al-Sham, Syria, Lebanon, all this stuff, subhanAllah. Okay, then Al-Hasan al-Basri, al -Hasan, uh, al -Hasan, I'm sorry, Al-Hasan ibn Ali, he's the son of Ali, radiallahu anh. Some people consider him the fifth Khalifa, right? And also, he started what we call the age of the young Sahaba and the Tabi'een. Young Sahaba, because these are now age-wise, they're far away from Prophet Muhammad, so they're younger. Meaning they witnessed Prophet Muhammad when they were young. So they call them young Sahaba, right? Um, like, uh, um, like Zayd ibn Thabit, I believe. He was young, right? He was like 11 years old when he saw Prophet Muhammad and, so and others, right? Um, and what's a Tabi'i? Anybody can tell me? I know you know. Don't tell me. Tabi'i. Wait, I haven't given chocolate for a while. You actually answered a couple of times. And I think you answered too, right? Who answered you? Amina, you did, right? You did answer, right, last time? Okay. Who's the Tabe? Yeah. Yeah, Okay. Anything else? Yes, they witnessed the Sahaba. Tabi'i did not see Prophet Muhammad. But he saw Sahabi. So that's called Tabi'i. So he is Yatba'u. And there's something called Tabi'i Tabi'i. Who saw Tabi'i, did not see the Sahabi, saw the Tabi'i, right? He's like chocolate, man. <laughs> Sorry if I'm throwing things. Okay. Um, during that time, also expansion, right? Muslim Islamic State, and you can see inshallah in the slides went to Africa, Europe, Asia, right? Sects starting becoming stronger, like the Shia and the Khawarij, they actually become stronger, right? And then, now, this was the beginning of school of fiqh. Two schools of fiqh formed. One is in Hijaz, Hijaz is what? Mecca, Medina, right? Um, and one in Iraq. The school of fiqh in the Hijaz was called, uh, was called the school of the Hadith, Ahlul Hadith. Ahl meaning people of, Ahl of Ahlul Hadith, the people of Hadith. Why? Because in Mecca and Medina, all the Hadith was available, right? All the Sahaba know the Hadith, so they call them Ahlul Hadith. They know the Hadith very well. In Iraq, it was far. Iraq from Hijaz at that time was far. They didn't have access to the Hadith. So they developed something called Ra'i. Ra'i meaning opinion. So they became Ahlul Ra'i. The people of the opinion. That doesn't mean the other ones don't have opinion. But if you have Hadith and it's clear cut, that's it. The other one, try to rationale about it. And even when they got hadith, they try to make logical out of it sometimes, right? Do these two schools fight? No, they did not fight. They did not fight. When those people heard, especially Ahl Iraq, heard from Al Hijaz or Ahl al Hadith, they accepted. Um, right. The science of the hadith was born, beginning to be born. The science of hadith meaning what? Meaning the narrators of the hadith, who is trusted, who is not, that kind of thing, right? The narration and stuff like that. And also, this age, this time, the, the beginning of fabricated hadith be, be started to show. Fabricated hadith, already. Hadith, what we call hadith, mawdu'ah. Mawdu'ah meaning fabricated, right? And if you look at the fabricated hadith, it had three reasons. Let me see if I can remember them. Number one, 
is malicious. Someone on purpose making mawdu hadith to destroy the religion. Shia could be one of them. Khawarij could be one of them. Like that. They want to destroy. Mu'tazala could be one of them. So intention is bad. Number two is funny. Number two is those are people who actually number two is not too funny. But someone who is worshipping Allah so much that he started saying, you know, let's, you know, Prophet Muhammad I believe he said, do this, 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 when he never did this, to, to encourage people to worship more. His intention is good, worship more. But he ended up making a hadith which is mawdu, which is not correct. That's not good, right? And the third one was, that's the funny one, people who sold items. For example, they sold chocolate. He says, you know, Prophet Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad said, chocolate is good for you. So people said, oh wow, it, yeah, why not? So chocolate is good. To promote, I know, to promote their stuff. To promote their commercial, right? Uh, their, their stuff. Also, there was mass, con massive conversion of the non-Arabs to Islam. Because all of a sudden, we went to Europe, went to Asia. These are non-Arabs, right? They become non-Muslim. So all of a sudden, you see different look for the Muslims, not just the Arab, right? And in this, in this time, it went to North Africa, it even started to go to Al-Andalus, Al-Andalus which is Spain, right? Uh, by the way, also this era, this time is also called the Amawiyya era. The Amawiyya era is Nisba to Muawiyya, al Amawi, right? And it lasted like less than 100 years. Again, you don't have to worry about all that. Read it, it's nice history, just to appreciate the, the understanding of film. And then the next phase is what we call the emergence of the Imams of Fiqh. Can anybody give me one Imam of Fiqh name? Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa. Anyone else? Shafi. Malik. Al-Bukhari. Al-Bukhari is Imam of Hadith. Not Fiqh. Hadith. Good one. And then? She want to she wanna come back. Ibn Hajj, no, Ibn, ha Ibn Hajj is, Ibn Hajj is Imam of Fiqh. Uh, yes, you're right, he is, he is, he is, he is absolutely. Imam Hanbali? Al-Hanbal, Ahmed Ibn Hanbal, yes, yes. Ibn Hazm? Ibn Hazm is also Imam of Fiqh, not very well known to a lot of people, but he is, right. So, the Imams of Fiqh started showing up, right? They didn't call themselves Imam of Fiqh, right? And they didn't call themselves, hey, come to, to, take Fiqh from me, right? So we know that now the Islamic State is expanding. Imagine expanding, going to new territories and stuff, right? The, this is now what we call the Khilafah Abbasiyah. This is the Khilafah Al-Abbasiyah Nisbah, relative to Al-Abbas, which is the uncle of Prophet Muhammad This is his descendants. And the Khilafah Abbasiyah always said, we come all the way from Prophet Muhammad They're not Shia, not Shia, right? Even though they actually, uh, even though some of their khulafa, some of their leaders uh, had allies with the Shia. To destroy the Amawi Khilafah, which is before them. Politics. <laughs> Politics. Right? Not right, but that's what happened. So the Khilafah Abbasi, they started, first of all, the first Khilafah Abbasi was long, 500 years. The first 200 years, they centralized the government in Iraq and stuff. And then the next 300 years, they started decentralizing. Why? Because the Islamic Khilafah was so big now, all of a sudden. And they were like smaller states within the state. And there was also corruption. And there was also some luxury. So they had to decentralize. Now, um, the evolution of what we call the madhabs started showing up, right? Um, the, how did the fiqh come here? First of all, uh, oh, sorry. Also, the hadith started being compiled. Like Al-Bukhari, like Muslim, right? These are amazing scholars who went around collecting the hadith and authenticating this hadith is correct or not based on the science of the hadith or ilm al-hadith like we talked about it, right? Um, also, you started seeing tafsir al-Quran. Before in the Sahaba, everybody know Quran, what it means. But as you go far away from Prophet Muhammad now we're talking, we're talking 132 to 339 after Hijrah. Right? Between 130 to 300 plus after Hijrah, people, they're human, right? They, they don't know the tafsir. So now you'll see something like Imam al Tabari. He show up and he does tafsir. And there is also something called Usul al Fiqh, like Imam al Shafi'i. And uh, he, he wrote the first book called, uh, it's called Al Risala, 
right? Um, and don't worry about it. Just want to show you that there's different things that are happening, right? Also, there's more sects that showed up. Before that, it was what? It was the Khawarij and Shia. Now, Al-Mu'tazila showed up. Now, Al-Ash'ariya showed up. What are these? They're messed up. Let's just put it that way, right? We're not going to get into it, right? But there are different sects um, that, uh, for example, I believe one of them, Mu'tazila or Ash'ariya, they says, if you worship Allah so much, something you don't need to pray. Something like that. Like they drop many things, you know? Um, in the Abbasiyah Khilafah, intellectual research or intellectual freedom of int intellect became dominant, even divine ideas. Someone said, you know, you really think hijab is... Like they started discussing things that should not be discussing, right? Amongst themselves. Not those imams, you know, in general, people. Uh, there was a lot of debates, a lot of discussions. Uh, and then the first compilation of fiqh books started happening. Imam Malik wrote something called Al-Muwatta. Al-Muwatta is a book of Imam Malik. And then Al-Shafi'i wrote Al-Risala. Okay. By the way, these books do exist. You can actually find them online and, and download them, but in Arabic. I think someone also translated them in English. Wallah. Each one of those books is like 2,000 pages. Those guys wrote them by hand. Imagine. We have to have that kind of respect and appreciation to these guys, right? Now, how many Imams are there? Everybody says four, right? These are the famous four, Ibn Hanbal, Hanafi, Shafi, uh, Malik. Actually, there was about 13 famous ones. Actually, one of those, his name was uh, al Layth. al Layth was more knowledgeable than all these guys. Than Ibn Hanbal, than Shafi, than Malik and then uh, 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 Shafi, Abu Hanif. But what made one faqih or one imam more famous than others? Anybody? His students. His students. Excellent. Yeah, you got it. Good shot. Here. <laughs> one with nuts. <laughs> but don't go nuts, okay? <laughs> His students. The students of those imams are the ones propagated his uh, madhab or his ideas or not the students of Imam life were weak they don't take notes you know <laughs> sorry <laughs> people are like whoa I forgot my pen right now <laughs> everybody's like I'm taking notes just an invisible pen um, they were weak they were weak they were not strong right they don't study enough whatever it is right uh, like for example Imam Malik this is a famous one right uh, sometimes you ask people who why when you pray you put your hands on the side? He says, I'm Maliki, akhi. But if you read Imam Malik fiqh, he always say, you do this. You actually put your hands. So where did that come from? Imam Malik, at the end of his time, he became paralyzed. It's said that, uh, it's said that the Khalifa wanted him to be a jurist or something, and he disagreed, so they tortured him. So he became paralyzed. He could not lift his hand. His weak students saw that, so this, and said, this is the fiqh. And they started propagating it. But if you read his book, it says, you put your right hand on your left hand, just like Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith. So the students make a lot of difference, right? And we have the four imams, the four famous imams. Um, these guys are amazing. They lived, they, they breathed knowledge, and seeking knowledge, and, and, and understanding, and all this stuff, right? They, most of them become judges at early ages. Most of them, the Shafi'i memorized Quran, I believe, when he was five, six, seven, something like that. What? You know? You become Qadi, like a judge, 13. What? But think about it too, that they allow 13 years old to be judged. Now, right, he could be 30. But people hear all of them like 60, 70, like, what are you, little kid, come tell us what to do. Right? They had this respect, right? Um, there's, there's other Imams like Al-Basri, like uh, 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 Sufyan uh, uh, Ibn Uwayna, very, very famous guys. Okay, let's keep going. Um, after that, the four Imams showed up, right? They, they, they made their best about the fiqh and fiqh and usul fiqh and stuff. Their students started um, propagating their, their ideas. Um, after that, starting at 339 after Hijra all the way to 656 how many like 300 years right there become an era called the rivals of madhabs 
the rivals of Madhab. Does that, does that sound familiar? That's familiar now, right? When someone says, I'm Hanafi, Akhi, you're Hanbali, I don't want to talk to you. But back then it was worse, right? The rivals of, of Hanafi, uh, of uh, the Madhabs, th- at that time, the Crusaders showed up. You know the Crusaders, right? Came to Palestine and all that stuff from Europe, right? The decline of the Abbasi khil- Khilafah was happening. The Mongols showed up. You know the Mongols, right? The Mongols, which is amazing because they came and they destroyed Baghdad. And Baghdad was like, like wealth of books. They said the rivers were red from the ink. They used to drop the books in the river to pass the river. They have no respect for knowledge, just want to kill. But subhanAllah, a lot of those Mongols become Muslims later. And they introduce Islam to China. That's why you have Mongolia and you have the south of China and west of China as Muslims, right? Uh, there was a drastic reduction of madhabs. They really went literally from 13 to about four, right? Discovery of papers happened at that time. Uh, the madhabs now were kind of more organized into systematic opinions and formats like the books we know today, right? Uh, and there was no ishtihad. In that era, there was no ishtihad anymore. People just want to use what they have already. That's the rivals, the rival. But that's the beginning of even what's worse. The next era, we call it the taqlid. Anybody know what taqlid is? Wait, raise your hand. Wait, he knows all the answers. Anyone else? Taqlid. Qallada yuqallidu fahuwa muqallid. Some people look at me like, وَفَسْطَرَ الْمَاءَ بَعْدَ الْمَاءِ بَعْدَ الْجُهْدِ بِالْمَاءِ There's an Arabic say said, and he explained the water after a lot of effort with water. I mean, he used water to explain water. I mean, he didn't help him, right? Okay, so, taqlid. I'm ignoring him. He's like, me, me. Okay, go ahead. Blind following. Blind following. Taqlid is blind following, which we still have today. This era was from 656 after Hijra to 1342 after Hijra. Everything is in the notes, don't worry. Right? You talk about what? You talk about 700 years. 700 years of blind following. Right? This is after the downfall of the Abbasi Khilafah, uh, other ethnicities and groups starting to claim the Khilafah here and there. Right? Um, Muslim Spain fall to the Europeans. Um, there was a lot of decentralization. The Ottoman Empire starting showing up, right? There was also the Mamluk state in Egypt. This is all history, good to know. You don't have to worry too much about it. The European expedition started to show up. Indonesia was occupied for 300 years, that kind of stuff, and others. The First World War happened, right? Ottoman Empire got dragged it in and then fall, right? And then the conversion of Mongols to uh, Muslims. What's the characteristic of this time? The blind following, taqlid. That's the, that's the worst thing, taqlid. No creativity, no ijtihad, no, no effort, whatever they said. Not only that, they started to learn how to defend one, one's madhab. The best way to defend my madhab. I'm Hanafi, I forgot your name. Rani. Rani. Rani is Hanbali. I'm going to learn how to make him look bad. I don't learn how to make him, like my madhab is, they, start, they started writing books about that. How to attack the other madhabs. Horrible, right? Horrible, right? That's what happened when we blind follow, right? No ijtihad, the death of the scholars, true scholars, right? Not only that, but because of the, Islam now is still big, a lot of places. Scholars are not talking to each other. There's a lot of separation, right? Um, the Europeans actually learn a lot of the laws of, the, of our Islamic uh, state thinking especially from Spain. Back then, Europeans, you think about something, you want to invent something, they, they shoot you, call you a magician, and they, they kill you. They learn from us. They learn from Europe, uh, from Spain, right? Uh, if you heard about Ibn Taymiyyah, right? He was one of the, the scholars, and there's many more. Ibn al-Jawziyyah, there was another one, right? He was like around 1300 something uh, CE, which is the, what is that called? It's after Hajj CE is the, the calendar, the Western calendar. Thank you. Yeah, come here. Right. Um, and then after that, starting in 1924 CE, is what we called the reformation of the renaissance of fiqh. Meaning, let's go back to the Quran and Sunnah. Alhamdulillah. And that's what's amazing about Islam. It always go back to the correct way. No matter what, 
no matter what you see, divine groups, no matter what you see, malicious intent, no matter what you see, ignorance, there is always, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in that Quran, there will always be amongst you a group, fi'atun qalila, a small group that will always call for the truth, that will always call for Quran and Sunnah. Subhanallah. And around the history, you always see that, right? So, quick thing. Can we follow a little bit deviation of this? This is about this is what's kind of summary of the of the history of fiqh. Can we follow a madha? Is it okay to follow a madha? Yes, as long as you don't blindly follow it If you see something you should accept it. Okay. Okay. So brother said yes, as long as um, we don't blindly follow it. If we see proof of something against this madha, this specific situation then you go somewhere else yes what else this is this is a good one oh we even trying no, no, no. too many chocolate <laughs> like man I, I need i need tea with this um okay so it depends on your islam the answer is it depends on your islamic knowledge if you're a scholar or a alim or mujtahid, mujtahid is a higher than scholar by the way, or muhaddith, which is a different thing, you're not supposed to follow a madhab completely. Why? Because you have enough knowledge to know in every situation, Quran and Sunnah, Quran and Sunnah, Quran and Sunnah, right? If you are scholar. Now, I guarantee you none of us is, so skip that. If you are a student of knowledge, by the way, you are now a student of knowledge, there's different levels. Yes, and as you, the more you learn about Islam and the more you learn about fiqh, the more you understand it. If you're a student of knowledge, you should also make your best effort to follow Quran and Sunnah. Your best effort. But if you don't have knowledge, then you stick to something that you know, right? You will see when we study fiqh here that in some situations, I'm going to tell you opinion one, opinion two, opinion three from different scholars. After that, I'm going to tell you the opinion I'm comfortable with, you do not have to take that. It's very important. Don't just take whatever I tell you. I'm comfortable with a certain opinion, I'm going to go with it. You can actually be, be comfortable with something else. Okay? And that's again, like, like our brother said, flexibility sometimes, that you have more than one choice. More than one opinion. Unless it's very clear. Or unless there is sort of ijma, unanimous uh, agreement on certain opinion, that's a different story. Then we follow it, inshallah. Right? If you are a layman, layman meaning you don't have knowledge, you're not studying, you're not following Islam, it's okay, but we don't call it, number one, we don't call it follow, by the way, because follow, we only follow Quran and Sunnah, right? We don't follow madhab because the madhabs, the, the imams, what, how did they derive their fiqh stuff from Quran and Sunnah, right? And of course, ishtihad and stuff. Uh, if this person is a layman, um, it's, it, we don't call it follow, we call it we're comfortable with the interpretations of those imams for the text, for the Quran and Sunnah. That's their best interpretation. We are com comfortable with that. So it's okay to, um, I'm going to use follow again, but because it's easier, okay? But you got the point, right? To follow, first of all, you cannot say, I follow a madhab such as Hanafi or Hanbali or something. You cannot say that. Why? To follow someone or be comfortable with their teaching, you must have either one, seen that person, or two, read his books. Right? So Sister Amina asked me, Brother Amr, which uh, madhab you're comfortable with? If I say Shafi, she will say, did you read his book? No. Did you see him? No. Then you cannot say that. So why you say Shafi? Well, my teacher taught me Shafi. Oh, okay. So you're really following your teacher. Who said Shafi? But you never met Shafi, you never read Shafi. You realize the difference? It's important. Right. If you trust your teacher and he's pious and he's knowledgeable, that's fine. Right? But make sure you make that distinction that I learned that way. So if you're layman, it's okay to even follow an Imam of a masjid. Masjid you go to, it's okay even to follow that. As long as Three conditions. Number one, you see that imam. Nobody tells you that imam said this. You actually need to talk to him directly. That same rule. You have to see or talk, right? Uh, see, talk, or read. Number two, that person has to be knowledgeable. He has to have knowledge. 
How do you know that? When you ask him, he has knowledge. He pre presents you the lead. He presents you proofs, right? And number three, he's pious. At least one of us in this room must have seen sometimes imam or scholar who did something weird. Right? Who did something wrong. And you see that in Hajj. Inshallah, when you go to Hajj, you will see. Some of the people who run Hajj, when you see them, they're, they're smoking and they're cursing and they're, they're imams. And they miss the Salah. I'm not saying specific people by name, but I'm just saying you can see that. And Prophet Muhammad told us that. There will be imams who are misguided. There will be scholars who are misguided. So, that person must be also pious. Because if he's pious and he has knowledge, then everything, inshallah, is good. It's eight. I need to stop. Um, I have a map there for you. Inshallah, you can see it. You can see the spread of the different madhabs. Uh, give me one second. Yes. What do you call them? Like people want to move the post of the So will their hajj count? Oh, I see. Um, good, good question. That's a great question. So we're going with an imam. This guy is confused. We don't have knowledge. We follow whatever. Okay. First of all, you should learn, especially hajj. Because hajj you don't do every day. You should learn your hajj before you go, right? But I assure you, some people don't learn at all. They go, and when they're there, okay, what are we doing today? What are we doing today? Let's go. Right? You should not do that. It's very dangerous because that's your hajj. But let's say some people, old people, whatever, they don't have that access to knowledge. Prophet Muhammad said, Rufa'an ummati al khata wa nusyan. My ummah will not be judged for mistake or for forgetfulness. Forgetfulness meaning you want to pray, but you miss the salah unintentional. The alarm doesn't go off or something. That's a mistake. Right? You think you have wudu, you don't have wudu, and you pray. That's a mistake, right? Or uh, forgetfulness, al uh, khata wa nisya, khata mistake meaning you don't know. You don't know, and the person who you think knows telling you wrong, it's his guilt, it's his sin. Inshallah, inshallah, their hajj is accepted, but Allah subhanahu wa taala, Allah alam, will look at different situation, different ways. Some guy, he's young, he has PhD, but he doesn't read a word in Islam. He go to a hajj and. And the Imam told him, do this, 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 and he do whatever. He, you know, versus someone who's 80 years old. He just, he didn't have a chance to learn before. Allah, you know, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ghafoon Rahim, inshallah, uh, and he will judge everyone uh, uh, differently. Um, okay, give me one second. I have their things. Let me just read you one or two quotes from the Imams. Because, you know, you must have at least sometimes seen someone and he says, Yahi, you know what you do is not correct it's not the quran and sunnah and he says ah abu hanifa told me this like right he knows abu hanifa or are you scholar are you teacher whatever so malik ibn anas malik is imam malik right he says truly i'm only a mortal i make mistakes and i'm i am correct sometimes imam malik i am correct sometimes therefore look into my opinions all that agrees with the book and the sunnah accept it all that does not agree with the book and sunnah, ignore it. He himself told us, don't always follow me, right? Imam al-Shafi'i said, when a hadith is found to be sahih, then that's my madhab. That doesn't mean all his madhab is sahih, meaning if he finds a hadith, then he's going to follow that, right? Imam ibn Hanbal says, do not follow my opinion, neither follow the opinion of Malik or al-Shafi'i or al-Awza'i. Al uh, or a thawri, but take from from where they took. Don't follow all them. Take from where they took, which means Quran and Sunnah. That's Ibn Hanbal. And finally, Abu Hanifa. It's not permitted for anyone to accept our views if they do not know wh from where we got those views. You cannot just say I'm just gonna follow. You gotta understand, right? Um, we're gonna stop here, um, and I hope you. Uh, Benefited. We covered a lot. This is this is about ten classes of something called uh, fiqh history and uh, fiqh code and all that stuff. Any questions before we go? Oh, you you actually deserve a chocolate for that. Good question. <laughs> yeah. So inshallah, next week we are going to start actually talking about the purification itself. Oh, you have a question? Yes.
Right. So the brother is asking, um, this, this masjid, for example, is blindly following some madhab, even if you indicate them, they don't want to listen. So uh, the, the basic thing is, we as Muslims, we have to do amr ma'roof and na'al munkar, right? We have to do, if you see something wrong, you have to do something about it. With your hand, if you have authority, right? Because people think with hand, I'm going to go beat up everybody. That means if you have authority. If you're the leader in, and this is under your authority, you can use your hand. Or the only exception is, you're strong. You're walking in the street. Someone's beating up an old woman is going to kill her. You can stop him. Then you can. But most of the time, you do not actually use your hand. And then your tongue, and then your heart, right? That's what Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu told us. So we are asked to say. But the guidance is from Allah. إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءْ Allah is the one who guides. So you tell them, and when you tell them, you tell them with kindness, right? You tell them with wisdom, right? That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Prophet Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad, who was very kind. If you were rough and your tongue is rough and your heart, they would have left you. So you said that, and if they don't, they don't. That's it. Is that why? Question? Okay, so next week, inshallah, we're going to start talk about purification. We're going to talk about the type of water. You're going to realize water is not, is not only one type, more than one type, and how the water can be pure and not pure and all that stuff, and the implications of that on the wudu and ghusl and stuff, inshallah. Zakum Allah khair. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نستغفرك ونتوب إليك والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصل الحق وتواصل الصبر. جزاكم الله خير.